All right. Um, I'm David Agronoff. Um, this uh, interview is uh, featured on my blog, Postcards from a Dying World. Um, I'm a horror author and critic. I've got over 600 uh, book reviews on my blog. And uh, so that's my credentials. I'm also the author of Punk Rock Ghost Story, Amazing Punk Stories, and Boot Boys of the Wolf Reich, The Vegan Revolution with Zombies. Um, Are you just going to go through your whole catalog? Uh, no, I skipped at least one. Okay. So, <laughs> and I didn't talk about the books that are coming out soon. All right, um, and that uh, extremely sarcastic voice is um, Anthony Trevino, who's also here today. Yeah, that's right. I'm Anthony Trevino. I don't have nearly as many writing credits as David, but I am the author of the bizarro novella King Space Void, the horror comic fruition, and a bunch of short stories no one's probably read, but they're pretty fucking cool. And if you haven't read King Space Void, I definitely highly recommend it. And the man of the hour, the special guest today, is Chad Stroop. Stroop. Actually, Stroop. it's Chad Stroop, but nobody Stroop. ever since I was... Like in kindergarten, has ever pronounced that? Yeah, correctly. everyone so, calls me Argonaut. <laughs> and I, was just, I can't get. It. At this point, I just stop correcting people. Yeah, uh, I am the author of the uh, new novel, which is my debut novel, Secrets of the Weird, uh, released by Gray Matter Press, coming out July 11th, um, and that's what we're talking about today. Yeah, so we'll get into that um, a little bit. Um, well, we'll get into that completely here in a little bit, but, um, just to let everyone know, this will be spoiler free for the first 10, 15 minutes. We will give you, um, a warning before we go into full spoilers. The reason why Anthony and I are here to do this interview is because we both got to read an advanced copy of the secrets of the weird. Thanks to, um, our buddy with immaculate hair, Chad, <laughs> who, um, He's you know, got good hair. He's got good hair. Yeah, we're all um, San Diego horror authors, and we've worked together before because we um, actually all had stories in two anthologies called the San Diego Horror Professionals, um, which we all had individual stories in. But um, And we, we've um, hung out a few times with Chad, and um, Chad and I have gone to shows together, and so, um, and Chad babysat drunk Anthony at StokerCon 2017. <laughs> right. Uh, so, um, we, you know, we, we have to admit to a little bias here, but, um, we also, um, just as we said before we started recording, if Chad wrote a piece of crap book, we would have told him. I definitely would have told him. Yeah. We would have told Chad if he wrote a piece of crap book, but we <laughs> I would have cried in silence. Yes. Yeah, but we really <laughs> did like secrets of the weird. So we wanted to to do this and so this interview is being released on the week uh, we're recording this a month before the book is released but um, we will be releasing this interview right around that time so you'll be able to go right to Amazon um, to buy a copy or um, if you're in San Diego please go to Mysterious Galaxies on July 29th July 29th um, and pick up a copy from Chad and uh, get it signed by him and um, we'll be there to cheer you on as you buy a copy. <laughs> oh, I will fangirl hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, all right. Um, let's just like jump into the... Um, where, where did Secrets of the Weird come from? Well, uh, when I was uh, getting my bachelor's degree at SDSU, um, I, my original plan was I was going to get my teaching credentials, and so I was getting uh, a bachelor's in English, and I took a couple of creative writing classes just for fun because I used to write a little bit when I was younger and uh, just never really took it seriously. never really thought it was something I was ever going to try to pursue with any sort of seriousness uh, until I was well into my 30s. And uh, I was in a, in a, uh, in a class with uh, my professor, Mel Freilicher. Um I wrote a couple of short stories, one of which was pretty good and... and uh, you know, didn't really do much with after that. The other one was a short story version of Secrets of the Weird that essentially ended up becoming the first two or three chapters of the novel. But uh, my professor was very, like, into the story, thought, saw something interesting in it and sort of, uh, so you know, sort of the first season in my head of, of maybe that I should consider going to grad school. And that's something we could talk about later if we want to. But so ultimately, you, so you got support from for writing a genre piece, which actually yeah. a lot of genre writers that are in these MFA programs have a lot of time. Well, this is even before I was in the MFA program. Oh, I mean, this, okay. this was this was like a, a year before because I, I hadn't even thought about getting getting my MFA at that point. This was like because of that story, it was like, hey, maybe you should consider grad school. 
Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, uh, but then I started thinking also, well, there's more to this story here than, than just this, you know, 15-page short story. So how many years so. of Secrets of the Weird kind of lived in your head? <sighs> well, I guess that that short story was written about six years ago, I suppose. Yeah. I didn't start writing the novel till a couple of years after that. Um, I think it was... Once I once I got into grad school, I knew that was going to be my thesis manuscript. Right. And since it was a three year program, I was basically during uh, winter and summer breaks. I was working on the novel because I knew that the last year it was going to be all working on the manuscript, basically the entire third year. So I wanted to have like a full, solid first draft that could be workshopped and and you know, just fixed up as good as possible and. It really, it just kind of developed over from from that. That short that short story became something very big, obviously, and I di I didn't know what to what to do with it, where to go with that, other, aside from the you know very brief little story I had there. And I started thinking of all these interesting characters and how their lives could all intersect in some way. And I did a a very I guess you could say a very unorthodox way of quote unquote outlining this book. I, I'm not an outliner per se, but what I did was I created these abstract poems about each of the main characters. Basically, the poems were about their personalities and what their story arcs were, and the book came out of that. Suddenly, everything just flowed. <laughs> Excellent. Um, did you have a question? Yeah. Before? So you say it's it. You say that secrets started as the first three chapters are kind of similar to the short story, but mm -hmm. what what was the what's the difference? Because obviously, if it started as a short story, what mm -hmm. was that actual story? And how has it changed from that format to what it is now? Well, it wasn't a clearly defined story. I mean, it wasn't anything you would say was a very uh, well wrapped up, you know, beginning, middle, and end kind of thing. That's why mm -hmm. I realized this is, this is something more. Okay. You know, like I, I was like, okay, well, here's here's the story about about Trixie and 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 uh, meeting uh, Doctor Cast. And at that point, Cast didn't even have a first name. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Withering Wilds were were in that and uh, I was just like well this is a lot of weird stuff this is like oddball stuff you know but this is this is what I do you know these, I wanted I wanted to do something that I hadn't seen done before so so um, <laughs> sorry about the dogs barking everyone um, but so um, would you say that you was this the first time you kind of realized you wanted to be a writer or did you want to be a writer before that like, cause I know you've been a horror nerd mm -hmm. forever. I've been, I've been a horror nerd pretty much as, since I was able to breathe. I mean, yeah. since I was two years old, I was watching, you know, universal horror movies with my mom. So it was always in me. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I wrote when I was younger, like in high school, I, I remember actually handwriting like a 300 page novel, but I just did it just, you know, for shits and giggles basically. Yeah. It wasn't like I thought, Oh yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to be a writer. And I was like, yeah, that's not for me. That's what other people get to do. You know, it was a very, a very naive sort of thing, I guess, because anybody who becomes successful with their writing obviously has to pursue it in some matter and, and, and believe in themselves and, and do the work and whatever that is. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of different combinations that go into being a successful writer, but I just, I never really thought that that was something that could, could be my path. So for many years, the only thing I really wrote were lyrics because I was doing so many bands throughout the 90s and early 2000s that I wrote a lot of lyrics and so I took that writing very seriously but it wasn't anything I was trying to do as some sort of a career or anything it was just like this is fun I enjoy writing lyrics I think they, they come out you know sounding pretty good right and uh, well I was going to ask you about that because um you know um we are we have oddly a weird amount of stuff in common mm -hmm. being that we're both horror writers because we're both the constraint edge and we both came out of the hardcore scene. Although I grew up in Indiana and you grew up here in, in San Diego. Wow. And, but one thing that we both have in common, we both grew up horror nerds, both wanted to be writers. Mm -hmm. We both wrote cheesy attempts at novels when we were mm -hmm. kids. And um, you were more successful at the band thing than I was. <laughs> However, arguably, <laughs> well, well, you have several records. Well, out. yeah, yeah, you have yeah. several records out. I never got past the garage really, mm -hmm. like, and a couple shows yeah. with bands, um, and until recently. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but what's interesting is that I had a period where I was so into hardcore, I was so into music that. You know, wanting to be in a band became more important to me mm. than writing. Yeah. 
And I kind of lost track of that original dream of mine mm. to be a writer. Did that happen to you too? Or? Well, I think that in, in, in essence, yes, except I'd never really had the the dream like you probably had. I just thought, oh, this is fun. I enjoy writing, but like, yeah. that's all it is. And then said, I, I was so definitely obsessed. had the dream. I was so obsessed with being in a band and playing music and being so involved in that. You know, like I said, I never wanted to do it. I was never doing it to try to make money or to do, you know, anything like be some rock star or some crap like that. But like, I was, I really enjoyed playing and, and making records. And it just got to a point I realized, well, you know, even though I would still like to play in bands as I get older, this is not something I'm going to be doing with any regularity as I get older. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to have a creative outlet still. And I think that was the impetus was, was being in school and having that short story be validated even though it wasn't really even that good at the time, it, it was just like, okay, well, here, there's something here. Maybe you should think about this. And it was like a light bulb went off. Yeah. I was like, well, this is probably what I should be doing. <laughs> you know, like yeah. this is, this is, this is, this is my, my path from, from here on forth, basically. So, um, we're 11 minutes in. I mean, like, how would, how are you? I, I know your um, your editor told me that he kind of sees this novel as kind of unclassifiable, which I'm not quite sure I totally agree with because I definitely think the novel is a dark, fantastic, like dark, fantastic kind of um, setting kind of mixed with punk rock. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you pitch Secrets of the Weird? <laughs> That, that, that was my problem from day one because, like I said, I don't think it's completely unclassifiable. However, it's a little challenging to classify because there's a lot of elements going into it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's very strange, but I wouldn't call it a bizarro novel. It's got some horror elements, but it's certainly not a straight horror novel. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I mean, there's a literary quality to it. I mean, I've read a lot of literary fiction throughout my life, you know, in addition to horror fiction. So I think both of those influences kind of come in. Um, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I think dark, I think dark, I think punk, uh, punk edge, dark fantasy is what yeah, I've been that's, calling it. That's, I mean, that's, it's fairly accurate. You know, I yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't say no, you're wrong. Cause that's, that's certainly a big part of it. I, I think if you're going to simplify it into something that is easy to like tell somebody, yeah. That, well, look, that, it's, that, it, that it, will work. it's your first novel and mm -hmm. trust me, people are going to. Um, they're going to declassify it as things that are going to kind of make you cringe at some point, and then you're going to get used to them. Like, um, like when uh, my novel Hunting the Moon Tribe, like had for a while, like um, I swear to you, because I had interest from studios for a little while, and, and they were talking to me about it, and like they literally were calling it Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dracula, and that made me that made me want to puke. But pretty funny though. I, yeah, I was. Well, I think if, if, if you want what would come for me, what I was starting to tell people about, like within the last year or so, when I knew it was going to be coming out soon, and when people asked me about it, I basically would say, "Well, imagine if Clive Barker and David Cronenberg attempted a novelization of the Love and Rockets comic series, and that's kind of what it is." Yeah, no, the, so, that's that's a really good mm -hmm. description. But it also has a dark fantasy element to it that I'm that I see a lot in a lot of Neil Gaiman's earlier fiction. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, which I think is yeah. really impressive. And I, I mean, I don't know if trying to classify secrets as one specific genre is really a good idea because I think the beauty of that book is that it is unclassifiable. It's just a really great book. And it's a genre blend, which is something that I prefer to read more of. Yeah. Rather than say, oh, I read this straight horror novel, mm -hmm. I want to talk about how this book kind of takes all these elements from different genres and makes it wholly unique in its own. Otherwise, but, it just becomes formulaic and boring, yeah. and, which, and, is, which Secrets is not. Yeah, and I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't kick um, the Bizarro comparison totally out of bed because the thing is... I, I, yeah. Well, well I know... There's elements there. I mean, well, look, look... But, some, there's, but there's weird elements in the Damnation yeah. game. There's weird yeah. elements in the Great and Secret show. Well, let me, I wouldn't necessarily call it Bizarro. Yeah. Well, let me make my point because I'm not... Every yes, Captain Akronov. Well, listen, <laughs> not every Bizarro novel is like the the you know, walrus butt plug salesman. You but know, that's true. But there's a lot of Bizarro novels that are categorized as Bizarro that are really that aren't. Well, I'm talking about I'm maybe talking about Perfect Union, son. Exactly, books mm -hmm. like uh, Dead Heart Shelters, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. is a book that I would say is a, a similar type vein. Have you ever read? No. Dead, uh, who's, that, who's that by? <laughs> um, Forrest Armstrong. Okay. Yeah, it's um, really good. Yeah, I might send it home yeah, with you. Remind me about that one. Well, I might send it home with you. Um, well, side note, 
Shout out to Forrest Armstrong. We miss you. <laughs> yeah, he's got a book coming out. He just nice. said. He just said recently. Yeah. No, it's um, some of the best, most literary stuff to come out of the Bizarro movement. And, uh, but look, there is the dildo salesman books, and there's the the there's, but there's also the swallow down type stuff, and 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 lazy fascist and lazy and fascist. broken river, and so that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, I, well, that's I, the stuff I would gravitate towards. And I, I would say this book probably could appeal to the Bizarro crowd. Um, on yeah. a certain level, for sure, because well, you, there are elements of the you know the well, literary horror world in some Bizarro stuff, like you guys are talking about. And yeah. I, yeah. I did post my review of Secrets of the Weird to the Bizarro mm-hmm. Fiction pa- nice. page on Facebook, and, cool. and there was interest, and yeah. that's that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make yeah. sure that we didn't sound like we were disparaging Bizarro. Oh, at all. I wasn't trying to disparage it. Yeah, that's all. I'm just you, not, okay, not David. As, I stand corrected. I, I'm Thank just not you. as familiar with it as you guys. I've only become familiar with it. Strangely enough, here's a really weird twist for me. My my, uh, my professor in grad school, Stephen Paul Martin, who mentored me on Secrets of the Weird, was actually the person who introduced me to bizarro fiction. He told me to buy the, uh, and this is the funny thing, this is the first time I ever read a story by you, David, before I met you. Oh, the... Uh, the best bizarro fiction of the decade, decade or whatever that was. Yeah. He had that book. He's like, you should get this. I think you would like this. Like, this is, you know, not too far off from what you're doing. I'm like, oh, cool. And I saw that, like, Lansdale's in it, Bentley Little. I'm like, oh, yeah, there's some authors I already really love in here. Yeah. So... Okay, so you know, I bought that a couple months later, and I was like, okay, well, this is what Bizarro is. Some of it was cool, some of it wasn't. I mean, it yeah. is what it is, like with any genre. Yeah. But, um, and yeah, of course, so. my story was cool. Well, yeah. <laughs> just, just was a, it? Was it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, <laughs> Which maybe. one was it? Uh, Pucky, porcupine, Pine Moshers wow, of the you Apocalypse. Get your own story title wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> that one's not your best. Whatever. <laughs> no, I think I think we, you and me, Anthony, we had the same idea for what his best story was in the Amazing Punk stories, but I can't remember the title. Small of it. World. Yeah. Yeah. That one. Small That's world? the best story in that collection. Yeah, I agree. Oh, really? Because yeah. I thought you liked um, uh, Book Your Own Fucking Life, but whatever. I like that one too, yeah. but not yeah, as this much as I like me. Small World. Yeah. Okay, this isn't about me. <laughs> okay. So yeah. we're talking about secrets. But we of digress. <laughs> <laughs> but we're on the same page. Yes. Chat, so. <laughs> well, look. Um, so secrets of the weird is. Yeah, I, I definitely think the Clive Barker comparisons are are are, are apt. They're good, um, and I think that people who come to it because they're hearing those comparisons aren't going to be upset or let down. But one of the funny things is, you know, Clive Barker is a guy who kind of grew up in the theater community mm-hmm. of the '70s and in, in Britain, and you're a guy that came up through the hardcore scene. So there's differences right there mm-hmm. in that um, this. Sweetville, which is this mm-hmm. fictional city that Secrets of the Weird takes place in, is something that Clive Barker could never, never write, I don't think. Mm, perspective. You know, you know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And so what I think people should know is that, you know, if they come to it, for they're looking for more punk rock fiction, which, you know, that's kind of the niche that I've kind of carved out for myself. So if people who come to my blog, they might be looking for more stuff yeah. that's punk fiction. They can definitely feel comfortable reading Secrets of the Weird. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a huge element of it. I mean, it's it's not the only element, and it's not not even the biggest element of it, really. Yeah. But it's it's a very significant element of it. You know. Yeah. And just I think just alternative lifestyle, in a sense, is a huge point of it. Whether it's counterculture or whether it's you know now queer stuff or whatever. I mean, right, and you know, we we need to talk about that too because. Um, the main character is is transgendered, mm-hmm. um, born male, transitioning to female, um, and you know Anthony and I both believe that you handled it really well. Can you talk Thank about you. the did 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 you have to do research? Did you you know what was the process of writing a transgendered character, and can can the trans community feel comfortable reading Secrets of the Weird? Well, yeah, that was a big undertaking. Um, being someone who is a cisgendered male yeah um you know i have no idea what it's like to be a transgender woman that being said i don't think that should exclude me from from writing a character like trixie and i wanted to write a a character like her because not to say it hasn't been done in in horror or weird fiction obviously it has i just you know when i started writing this book i hadn't really seen it done Mm -hmm. and i wanted to write a character like that at the forefront of, of this kind of a book and do it with respect, I didn't want her to be a caricature in any way, or or anything. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want it to to be a disrespectful thing at all. I wanted it to be like, here's this character. She's a trans woman, and she's a human being in a sense. I mean, I try to keep, treat all my characters as human as I can, even if they're not human. You know, there's some characters in in Secrets of the Weird that are 
arguably human, <laughs> arguably not human. I mean, it's kind of like right. is what it is. But but somebody like Trixie, I, I wanted to make her sympathetic, flawed, likable. You know, anything that that, that I think a real should be in a protagonist. Yeah. You know, that, so you can identify with regardless of of what your sexual orientation is, what your gender is, whatever. I just wanted her to be a character that any reader would would be able to enjoy. Um, but I also, I hope that, that, that she's embraced by, by readers in the trans community. I mean, I, I'm sure it's not going to please everybody. You can't please everybody with every book or every story, or every character you create. Um, but I think... Well, look at what that, Caitlin McKiernan, who is actually transgendered, is a transgender person mm-hmm. and like gets accused of being transphobic. Um, Do you mean Caitlin R. Kiernan? Yeah, Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not... I know you're a huge fan of her... I don't even... I'm going to sound like a jerk Everyone should read Silk. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay. I've only read some short stories of hers, but I I need to read more. She's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but, you know, you know, she's definitely, you know, on the the spectrum there and, and has recently just on Facebook recently just talked about her struggles with, you know, people are are accusing her of being transgender. So this is like a landmine that I think you're definitely going to have to prepare yourself for. Yeah. I I mean, you know, I I say, bring it on. I'm ready to have discussions. I I think, I don't think anybody could accuse me of, of, of creating a character that I didn't put love into though. You yeah, know, and I, I feel very strongly about. Yeah, I'd ag- I'd agree with that, and I, I feel strongly about that too because it's not. It, it never once felt to me like I'm reading a character written by a straight white male who clearly didn't handle this with care, mm-hmm. you know, and and I think that one of the best things you did is that. Her transition is a very important part of the story and who she is, but there were moments where. I honestly forgot about it because I was just more invested in who she was as a human being. Yeah. And I think that that really speaks to the strength of the writing in the book. Cool. Uh, excuse our <laughs> sirens. Um, when you take us away. So, um, yeah, Trixie was a great character. Yeah. Um, on, on every level, um, I lost myself in her as a character. Yeah. Uh, she was totally believable. Um, you know, it's funny though, cause I, we don't want to completely sound like we're licking your butt the whole time. <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, like Trixie's boyfriend, um, mm-hmm. was so much like you, mm-hmm. um, that it, it, I will admit that Christopher kind of took me out mm-hmm. of the book a little bit because mm-hmm. he was straight edge, he was in bands. Yeah. And so there was a degree that I like saw your immaculate hair on his head. He didn't have my haircut. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's true. He didn't, but I recently wrote a character that does. Okay. So, so here's just for Chad. So here's the thing. Mm. Um, well, and I assume Christopher probably doesn't eat as many vegan treats as, as you do, Chad, but, <laughs> um, he's definitely a skinny guy. <laughs> right. So, so here's the thing. Um, I, 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 uh, what I bring that up mm-hmm. to do or just to illustrate is how well Trixie was written as a character mm-hmm. because, um, and it's not that Christopher wasn't a good character. It's just, he reminded me a lot of you and I don't think that's going to affect the readers who don't know you, Yeah, but I know you. So, yeah. so that in that sense, like I couldn't kind of get that out of my head, but that's a me thing. I think that but, is definitely a you thing because I never, I didn't have that problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll see. It might, it might be more of just because of the similar, you know, yeah. scenes that we grew up in. The and similar stuff, scenes, but. yeah. And so, but my point is, is that Trixie was such a well-written character mm-hmm. that I think that highlighted it more mm-hmm. for me because I believed in Trixie and I, I just, you know, thought Trixie was a great character. We both agree that Cast, the Doctor, mm-hmm. um, who is kind of the antagonist mm-hmm. of the of the story. Um, that dude needed more pages, dude. Um, and we hope that... There was less in the original drafts. <laughs> really? There was a whole chapter that, that I wrote. Um, uh, well, Tony, my editor, he uh, basically said, I want, I want more casts. And so I wrote another chapter that was very cast-centric. Well, um, he was a smart man. He should have <laughs> leaned on you a little bit more because we... Yeah. But I don't know if I'd call Dr. Cast the central antagonist. I feel like that's more of the angel ghoul. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that... 
the pivotal role that Dr. Cass plays mm-hmm. in Trixie's life, he's at the very beginning, he's at the very end. A little bit in the middle. And a little bit in the middle. But <laughs> I needed more I needed more of that character to interact with her to make that ending transition. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, spoilers everyone. Um to make that <laughs> transition. Whoa, 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 whoa. Save 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 that. For later. <laughs> we'll but get to that. We'll get to that. But look, look, um, you know, Anthony and I both like weird characters. Mm-hmm. And like it, and you know, we have a project coming up that we're working on writing and, together, and it is chock full of weird fucking characters. So we're obviously going to gravitate to a character like Kath. Yeah. But I also think the other readers will too, and that when when you do write the sequel, which now you have to, <laughs> um, when you do write the sequel, we're we're going to be constantly sending you messages on Facebook saying, "Where's Kath?" So. Um, Anyway, so we're we're twenty five minutes into this. Um, what what kinds of things do you want readers to know before we get into spoilers? Like, you know, what are because this is this is one of your first opportunities to really just like straight up talk to people about your novel that's yeah. coming out. I mean, you've got to feel really great. Here comes this novel yeah, that you've worked on for six years, exciting. and believe me, look, I've been trying to get that message home too because there's a lot of young authors today that don't have the patience. And, like, they self-publish just because they can't wait. Yeah. And sometimes I see some of them posting paragraphs of their book. Mm-hmm. Or I even saw um, some posting ideas for books on Twitter. And I'm like, are you insane? They can't wait. And, you know, here you're at the end of a six-year journey. Like, you know, what what, what are your, your biggest thoughts about having that six-year journey done? Well, I mean, it's obviously very exciting. I think anytime you you have that validation that somebody believes in your work enough to publish it. I mean, this is not the this on self publishing or anything, but like the fact that I hooked up with, with Grey Matter was was serendipitous, I think. I think just I had done a short story for them before and uh, you know, just had a little relationship with them, tried getting some other short stories published with them. Nothing ever worked out, but uh when they were opening up to novel submissions, I'm like, okay, well, yeah, that's going to be one of the first places to go because I loved working with them on the short story. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm so glad that it worked out because I think that uh, Tony Rivera, who's my editor and main person I worked with on this book, I mean, he really got, got it. You know, he yeah. he completely understood it, like it, completely backed it, completely excited about it, and that I couldn't have asked for more than that because, you know, I think there's some publishers out there who would be like, oh, yeah, this is a good book. I really like this. I want to publish it and whatever, and it might be kind of... That's what it is, you know. They're they're not going to push it because they don't believe in it, which is kind of weird. That there there are probably publishers like that, and I hope there's not too many of them because why are you even in the business if you're doing? That? Right. <laughs> but but I'm sure they exist. But I think just getting getting that connection where you're like, okay, you've got somebody who is almost sharing your brain with you in a sense that they get your book so much and they know what you're going for and and how to get it to the final point that you want to have it because I had it in good shape when I submitted it, but it wasn't perfect. I mean, yeah. no book is no, no matter how you know how perfect you think it is when you submit it, there's going to be changes. There's going to be ways to improve upon it. And, and I think it's... Uh, I'm it, telling it, you, brother, you're going to look back at the book for five years and <laughs> look at the ways you want to improve it. Oh, of course. I mean, the, no, no, no story is ever really completely done. But I'm, I'm happy with, with what is being published. No I mean, story I, is done. You just like go, who's yeah. the writer that said that? Um, <laughs> I don't remember who. I really honestly don't, um, but I think it was Brad. But Murray. I mean, this is, this is, the, the, this is the book I... I wanted to write because it's the book I wanted to read. I mean, I, I take that whole approach. I mean, I, I, I'm definitely of the write Word. what you want to read, you know, and that's... Yeah, I think very write, exciting. write what you want to read and write what nobody else can write. And yeah. what's cool about this book is I can't... Okay, I see the comparison that you made, but that didn't come to my mind mm-hmm. because I didn't have an immediate comparison. Mm-hmm. Uh, like other than like, well, it's kind of Clive Barker and it's yeah. kind of punk rock and it's kind of this and that. I could do that, but there wasn't anything where I was like, oh, this book is totally this. And you know, Neil or uh, the Neil Gaiman uh, comparison that Anthony made is a very valid one that yeah. I I didn't think of. Um, and so in that sense, like I think you got something really cool and original. Um, should have been born British, apparently. Well. <laughs> 
<laughs> with Trump being president, we kind of all feel that way. But I guess they've got their problems too. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're exact. We're almost to the thirty minute mark, so this is a good time to get into spoilers. Okay. So those of you who are listening and haven't read the book, it's time to stop. But remember that this is here, so when you come back to it later, <laughs> come back to the thirty minute mark when you have read Secrets of the Weird, and you'll get more insight into the book because that's what we're going to be doing now is the insight into secrets of the weird <clears throat> so we are now in spoilers um spoiler a ho uh luke um or uh darth vader is luke's father oh, i was like I was yeah like, who's luke i didn't know the character yeah. named luke yeah <laughs> um <laughs> That Bruce Willis was dead the whole time. And, uh, Soylent Green is people? Soylent Green is people. Wow, how many more cliche like, twists can we pack into this, you guys? <laughs> All right. Jesus. So, so now... The old man cast in here. <laughs> so, Nobody said we were young. All right, so... You're always young in my heart. Mm-hmm. All right, so Secrets of the Weird. Um, now, this part of it, we're... I think we're going to dial back some of the, some of the criticisms that we have because we're here with you and we want to talk about the process and all those mm-hmm. things. Um, you know, neither one of us are going to claim that either one of us has written a perfect book and we know nobody's written a really a perfect book except for maybe uh, a few people, <laughs> a few masterpieces out there. But his name is Cody Goodfellow. I think John Shirley has wet bones, so <laughs> like you know, we have some masterpieces yeah. that we can think of. But well, again, it's it's kind of relative. I mean, it, yeah, it's subjective. Is, I mean, this is your first novel, mm-hmm. and for in that sense, I would say this is a hell of a first novel. You set and the bar you're... incredibly high. <laughs> yeah, fuck you. Well. Um, <laughs> I mean, you always ah. know a book is good when it makes you as a writer go God. Damn. Yeah, <laughs> and have to step up yeah. your own game. No, I feel I feel that when I've, I've read some stuff too. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, okay. There's, yeah, there's writers out there that'll make you well, it's either fun. want to quit or get better, depending on you know. Yeah, like I how had much the, you want it badly. I yeah. think the last one that really did that for me was uh, Little Heaven. Um, Nick mm-hmm. Cutter really made. I have me, that on my shelf. Yeah, Facebook? yeah, that really made me um, go, damn. Um, but and there are certainly moments where you know. Um, in Secrets of the Weird War, I was just like, damn, Chad, good job. <laughs> um, and I was very proud, as your friend, I was mm-hmm. very proud of you for having written such an amazingly powerful first novel. Now, in that sense, so let's stop shining you here and just get into the, <laughs> the content. Um, okay. Sweetville as a place, is this is this a an alternate universe, or did you base this city on somewhere? Is this an actual city that... We're just kind of hearing a name for what? What's the deal with Sweetville? Well, um, not so much an alternate universe. I sort of refer to it as a revisionist dystopian version of the '90s, in which this city that didn't actually exist does yeah, exist. Yeah, because Clinton is president. Yes, Clinton is president at the time, and uh, all the references you get to various things are very '90s. And Christopher and references uh, um, the song "Straight Edge." Yes, yeah, so I mean, mm-hmm. there's well, of course, and then now we're getting back to the '80s, but I mean, that yeah. all comes before. Basically. But that's our world. Basically, everything exists in this world. It exists in our world, except for the things that I created and added to it. Yeah. And Sweetville, I initially envisioned as sort of an any town, anywhere kind of place. However, the more I started thinking about it, the more I thought it, if I were to give it a place, it would probably be some middle of nowhere, California, kind of like north of Bakersfield or something, you know, like just somewhere that wasn't, yeah. you know, just somewhere out in the middle of nowhere yeah. that right. just didn't, that was close enough, you know, if you could drive a few hours to get to Los Angeles or drive to the Bay Area, but it was just so secluded. That, that it that, had its own yeah, kind of culture. Had its own, yeah, its own little culture, basically, and its own uh, weird things that were going on that might or might not be occurring outside of Sweetville. That's kind of up for debate, but, you know, I yeah. don't really address that, but. Certainly. And, and so, you know, okay, so your main character, Trixie, is transitioning. Mm-hmm. Um, and so some of the things that happen, there's a really good love story between Trixie and Christopher. And I would think the whole, like, hiding of her secret of, you know, her gender dysphoria, like, probably was a very hard thing to write. Yeah. Like, um, and I'm sure like the fact that they don't really actually have a happy ending at this point mm-hmm. at the end of the book. Yeah. Um, 
that had to be difficult. Did you have, uh, um, so anyways, I'm just wondering if you want to talk about like the, because I really definitely thought they were going to a happy ending. They basically mm-hmm. got back together at least one time after mm-hmm. he found out, but I, I'm just wondering like how you felt about writing that part of it. Well, I think unfortunately their relationship was doomed from the start just because of the dishonesty. Yeah. Um, and it's part of what makes Trixie, you know, a flawed character. I mean, she's, like I said before, I wanted to make her very likable and I wanted to make her, you know, the kind of person that any reader would, would root for. But that she has these problems, you know, where she obviously isn't confident enough in herself and she's afraid that she's not going to be accepted for who she is. Therefore, she just wants to basically pass and not, you know... Not, so she not. doesn't tell Christopher and that dishonesty... Yeah. And look, Christopher accepts the truth... Pretty much, um, like so, well, I think he does and he doesn't. I don't think he's been able to reconcile it with himself, right? And you know? I, th- but I think he still loves her. Yeah, and um, you know, I think some would like to see the happy ending here, but maybe the more realistic thing in writing the story is that they have this challenge to their relationship. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's going to be a hard part because I think a lot of readers are going to be rooting for them hoping to get they'll, back. They'll see it they're again. hoping they'll get back together. And, and, yeah. and uh, you I, as the writer had to be the asshole. No, I know. I, I had to apart. think about it. Well, the way I looked at it is that most relationships, most people have in their early twenties are very tumultuous. And they don't and, work and, out. And anyways. they don't. Yeah, they don't. They don't work out. They, you don't end up marrying that person or partnering up with that person or whatever it is, and, and to have this whole other aspect going into that with you know the 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 secrets that Trixie was harboring and and I just think there, there was no way it could have worked out. Now, is that is, is there still a chance? I don't know. I'm not going to say one way or the other because I don't even know. You know, you haven't. I know I, I know a lot about more things that I want to explore with this world. I don't really know if there are things that I necessarily want to explore with that relationship or not. We'll see. Um, mm-hmm. But it could just be one of those things. I mean, sometimes you just move out of somebody's life. You don't exist in somebody's life anymore. I mean, think think of how many people you've had in in, in your life thus far that have just vanished. You never see them again, even though you used to spend every waking moment with them. Or mm-hmm. you cared about them, may even felt that you loved them at some point, and then they're just not in your life anymore. That could be what happens with, with Trixie and Christopher. Or they could be able right. to still be friends. I don't know. I mean, there, there's a lot of ways that can go. I think, um, I know Anthony wanted more of Christopher and his band no. uh, in the book. <laughs> so um, let's, let's talk about that aspect of it. Writing... Um, you know, writing. Look, look. Nobody knows more about fucking writing bands into books than I do, um, because I've had to do it a lot. You have to come up with yeah. a fake band name, yeah. and you have to a lot of times write music and lyrics, which mm-hmm. which both you and I have done yeah. for our books. And so I'm interested in, um, you know, the the band doesn't play. They play a role in the novel for mm-hmm. sure, but they're not an overriding yeah. part of the novel. But how much was as a punk rocker, was it important to you to visualize the band and and it's to make Christopher a, a full fledged character? Well, I mean, yeah, Christopher is obviously a very important character in the book, um, but it's interesting that you know some people, it's sort of a musician joke. A lot of people wouldn't consider him a very important part of the band because he's the bass player. You know, like I think I referenced something in the book that bass players are the redheaded stepchildren of the music world or something like that. Yeah. So he's, he becomes this important role in the book, but. You know, a lot of people just think bass players are useless. I disagree, but, but uh, hey, the bass think... player was super important in punk rock ghost story. Let me <laughs> well, just say, there you go. Yeah, um, and I think that the uh, Mason and, and Steve, the other two characters, while they're a lot more minor, I think you know they're just there to sort of flesh out that you know band relationship and that friendship, and to just get into that world a little bit more. Um, Since Sweetville is, a, is is its own kind of world, I mean, could you possibly see a novel about even if Christopher and Trixie? Don't end up back together. Could you see Christopher floating his own novel in that universe? Ooh. Chad, can you see it? Because we want to see it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe. There's other characters, I think, that, that would be stronger to, to carry their own novel. I mean, my original thought was 
I have a couple of different directions that I could take a sequel. My my original thought, which I've kind of abandoned, was that, oh, I could just do another novel set in this universe that might involve some of these characters. Maybe Trixie would play a minor role. Other characters would be the main characters. But I, I thought Trixie is such a strong character that I probably, most likely, will have her carry you know, the sequel. Because Dude. She, you know. Dude. <laughs> the ending... You We're left. getting there already? Yeah. Well, no. We'll, we'll talk <laughs> about it, I guess, eventually. Yeah. But, dude, you ha- you can't just leave us hanging on Trixie, right? I mean, back me up, Anthony. We, we, we can't... The way you left this, like, I mm-hmm. seriously thought there... Because of all the ads that are in the back of the book, and mm-hmm. I'm not complaining, great matter, you have to put your ads. But... Um, because of all the ads, I just assumed... That was like another chapter? I assumed there was a whole other chapter, and when I turned it over and it was over, I was like, dude, dude, really? <laughs> well, when, when, I, when I wrote that, I wanted to design this book as, so in a sense, be a standalone novel, but there would be potential for more. You know, like, the idea is that, okay, even though it's not a tightly wrapped up story, which I did on purpose... I think, Dude, it's you know, not tightly yeah. wrapped up at all. Like, I, I just, I got to be honest <laughs> that's, with you. That's how I write, though. I mean, again, that comes back to, I think, the way I want to reflect real life, because so many, in, in real life, there are no tight plot threads. You know, everything sort of just does what it does. You know, you can control your life to some degree, but there are some things in your life that you can't control, and some things are never resolved. And I think that a lot of the things, especially a lot of the elements that lead up toward the end of this book, there's some... some "Quote unquote" plot threads that are not resolved. They may never be resolved, and I prefer it that way, just because I want it to as as much as this book is is not real and is not you know a book of realism. Right. That I want it to reflect real life as much as it can, despite all the weirdness. So I threw in things like that, and and the actual ending ending. It's ambiguous, but to me, I know in my heart that it that it ends. And it's in it, you know, there is an ending there, but okay. it's also a beginning. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, well, look, um, I recently just did an interview um, here with uh, Duncan Barlow, mm-hmm. who, um, guitar player, vocalist of Guilt, guitar Endpoint. player, Endpoint. Mm-hmm. He's, um, as far as the hardcore scene that I grew up in, mm-hmm. Endpoint was like one of the biggest bands. Mm-hmm. Like, I always saw them. And Duncan's now a fantastic, amazing writer. Yeah, um, I to read his stuff. <laughs> I, yeah, I probably should send you home with his book too. But um, but the thing about it is, is that um, you know Duncan and I talked about creating like punk rock teaches you to kind of create your own lane. Yeah. And we both had to learn because we we're both dyslexic mm. and have severe learning disabilities that we had to like kind of make our own lane. And I think one of the cool things about Secrets of the Weird is that it isn't like a ton of other books and maybe this should have been said before the spoiler mm-hmm. section because it's not really a spoiler but yeah. like the the you know you've created your own lane here mm-hmm. in secrets of the weird and i think that's really cool and i just i want to say that and, and in one way that that i will relate it to the spoilers is, is that the whole sweet candy the whole mm-hmm. kind of surreal universe of this city um in all of it, um, but the very realistic things of punk rock mm-hmm. that you've put into it that are very real uh, create an environment that we've never really seen before. And yeah. I, I think that making your own lane is, is, is a huge part of what makes Secrets of the Weird really good. I'm glad, um, glad that that comes through. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's that was, important to me. That wasn't really yeah. a question. That was no, more... it's, a, it's a statement. And I, it's the one I agree with. Because yeah. I feel like that's well, always something I wanted to do. Of course do. you fucking do, because I told you how great your book was. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's, it's how, it, with any creative thing I've done, when I've, when I've been in music, I mean, the bands I've been in have never been popular, and I think they're, they're, I don't know what to say about that, except I know that I always did what I wanted to do lyrically and how I wanted to approach things. It wasn't always the popular thing that I did. And I never wanted to do something that was just going to make people pat me on the back. I always wanted to challenge mm-hmm. whatever it was that I was trying to challenge, you know. And and I think that sometimes that can popularize things. Sometimes it, it, it doesn't. And uh, but I but I always stuck with that. And I wanted to take that same approach to writing fiction. Is that I'm like, you know, I'm going to write what I want to write. If if nobody likes it, I'm still going to be writing it. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, I hope people like it. I mean, that, that it, it, you know. That's the best case scenario is that you write what you love and people also love it, but it doesn't, if people didn't love this book, 
it's still something I'm very proud of. You know that I, I feel like I did something that that I can call my own. Yeah. You know, and and I didn't say you know I did this because I knew this would be the popular genre to write in. I did this because oh I know this is going to sell well. Yeah, who knows? I mean I have yeah. no idea what's going to happen. My my but, book that sells the least amount of copies is the one I'm most proud of. Yeah. It's just I, <laughs> like you know it it is what it is. Uh, Anthony, you're really fucking quiet. Do you have yeah, anything you to say? Going to fall asleep over here. No, I just really enjoy listening to Chad talk. Oh jeez. <laughs> Good lord. Somebody has a crush. Oh, you shut up. <laughs> um. Yeah, well, the, yeah, he, well, you were super jealous of this book, um, like, I, I guess, was it the prose that made you feel that way, was it the setting, was it the story, what, because it's stylistically, Chad writes very different from me, and obviously, but he, you write in such a way that creates a very vivid image of every scene, every character, everything that happens is so vivid that it, that's a something I've never been able to do as a writer. Also, if you want to talk about just how well the characters are written, the fact that one of your villains, I still didn't hate despite the fact that she kills a cat. Oh, we're talking about Cypress. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we sort of talked about this before. I'm like, uh, so yeah, do you have a, a, a crush on the neo-Nazi girl? Yeah, I might... <laughs> It might be the grossest crush I've ever had. <laughs> and, and the thing is, I completely designed that character for that reason. I was like, okay, I wanted to be like, I wanted to have people think, oh, I'm kind of attracted to her, but I feel really awful about this because yeah. she's horrible. It worked. She's horrible. Well, that's but, what. But Chris... I still ooh, I kind of have the hots for her. <laughs> well, Christopher, as a character, yeah. um, kind of he dates her off and on, yeah. and and which makes you know makes I, him problematic makes him problematic he's, he's got this thing that he's it's kind of his secret in a way you know yeah. he's got he's, he's he's not a racist and he's you know boinking this neo-nazi girl and he feels awful about it but he's letting his you know little christopher control him <laughs> yeah. it's not it's not it's not working out obviously no it's um, bad it's bad for him and yeah. It, and, and yeah but, but so okay so um yeah i mean the characters they're definitely super vivid. And then you have, like, you have, I won't say monsters, but, you know, um, very monster-ish. <laughs> things. things. like the... Um, Subhuman slash superhuman. <laughs> right. The angel ghoul and, um... The like, wilds. Which, by the way, angel ghoul, like, just kept... I kept thinking that was a misfit song the whole time I was... <laughs> Every... It sounds like a botched misfit title, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you could take Angel Fuck and Ghoul's Night Out and just like mix and them, into one. them together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, you know, it, it. I. I. Yeah, I would say those those aspects of, of the novel I think will really appeal to. I, I'm, I'm sure that some readers will be like wanting more of that mm -hmm. aspect of the book, but I think that the fact that it's not like in your face like every mm. minute of the novel yeah. is a strength mm. um, because I think readers should be wanting that you know what I'm saying well like, I figure if I, if I can leave you wanting more that's a good thing as long as you feel still feel satisfied in a sense you know I mean deliver in the sequel yeah. Chad <laughs> deliver in the sequel I, I, it's, it's already in my head yeah I already know we, we build up the second we part of a trilogy right. you know because <laughs> We are talking a trilogy here, right? Oh, well, maybe. Uh, but the knows? second part of the trilogy it goes way darker. Let's, let's keep that in mind. So I'm going to promote the idea of a trilogy here. You heard it here first. Uh, um, you hear that, Tony? Are you listening? <laughs> yeah, we're down. Um, so yeah, obviously we would like to see you get more sales um, because we want to see this. You know, we wouldn't be doing this. We wouldn't be sitting here tonight on a Thursday night. Um, you know, talking about this book, if we didn't really believe in it and want to see yeah, it. Yeah, if we well. thought this book was a hot pile of garbage, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. You'd just be like, buy our friend's book. <laughs> buy Chad, <laughs> buy Chad book. Okay. Book yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we obviously really believe in it. And, and um, so let me just take a peek at the book here for a second make sure I'm not missing... Um, some things because sometimes key elements that you want key to elements. Um, oh yeah, the ads and things. What was the story on that? <laughs> that was just me wanting to have fun. I, I I hadn't seen anything like that before. Um, 
I mean, there's books that have visual elements, obviously, and, and I've always enjoyed that when I've seen that. But I just thought, how cool would it be to think of this like as if this were a TV show, and suddenly you have a commercial break, and then suddenly you have this advertisement mm -hmm. that you know breaks up the story. And in a sense, I think that could be frustrating to some readers, which is fine because I like frustrating people. I think it's you know it's challenging and it takes takes you know takes somebody out of their headspace to think about something in a different way. But, you know, most of them are pretty brief, so I, I wanted to throw in some sort of humorous things that still related to the story in some way. They weren't just random. I mean, every, mm. every, every visual I add into this book, it tells part of this world yeah. in some way. So uh, I, I had to make sure that was going to be the case. But I wanted to, I just, yeah, I wanted to just break it up with some interesting elements that, that you wouldn't see in every book, you know? Right, and sometimes you 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 do these ideas, and then you're like, oh shit, now I gotta do more of it, <laughs> you know. And like yeah. for me, like with Vegan Rev, I did the um, quizzes at the end of every mm -hmm. chapter, and there were definitely times where I was like, man, I really don't want to write a quiz at the end of this chapter. <laughs> but um, and but by the the end of the book came out, I was happy with mm -hmm. all of them. But you know, um, so I think sometimes these ideas, like you know, can um, you can kind of screw yourself as a writer like now yeah. now nah, nah, i gotta do these but they're all pretty entertaining pretty funny and yeah i, I just like, wanted to keep them brief and, and keep them all different and, and when i wrote them i mean i i don't have any you know graphic design skills so i just kind of had a very general idea of how i wanted things to look um and i just wrote these little scripts for each commercial and each other visual that i did and i think they came out wonderful i think some of them came out better than i envisioned and some of them came out like like the the evangelical tract that uh, yeah. John, and it, John Kenzie did. That, that, he nailed what was in my brain. It was amazing. Yeah. I'd never met the guy before. Like, rough draft, he had it like down. I'm like, oh, That's we, cool. we got the right guy for the job. <laughs> and, and Anthony was supportive the whole time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it was interesting because I, I think it, it, it was something... Uh, that Tony didn't know how to deal with it first because, you know, they hadn't done something like this in, in their books before and, and we started thinking, well, what are we going to do about this? You know, okay, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to it. Let's just, let's just get through the editing process and, you know, get the book in good shape and then we'll get to the visuals. So that was the last thing we did was put all the visuals together. But yeah, well, I mean. Yeah, and sometimes, um, you know, I had one time where I wanted to, you know, an editor, some, you know, sometimes you, they can be, you, you, when I say supportive, because sometimes they're mm -hmm. right yeah. to tell you, like, no. Like, I wanted one time to uh, number all my chapters backwards mm -hmm. um, in a piece <laughs> where it was counting down, which, by the mm -hmm. way, has been done before. Logan's Run did it, mm -hmm. but uh, for a very specific reason. But I also had a specific reason why I wanted to do it, but um, it was so confusing. <laughs> Yeah, and reading you know. and and it was good because I think it, you know um, and it was Rose O'Keefe who said to me he's like no David like it's not working and so I think you know the relationship with the editor it's really cool that that you guys are on the same yeah. page with it yeah in so. the in the original draft of the book uh, actually all of the all of the chapters were just dates mm -hmm. so you had the 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 now which was nineteen ninety three. Uh, just was dates instead of chapter one, chapter two, whatever, and and uh, then you had the journal entries which had dates. But I think we started to think, oh, this is kind of confusing because even though you know, in a sense, it's nonlinear because it's jumping from the the now into the journal entries which are a couple of years prior. Uh, I think it made it almost a little too confusing, and so we started to think, okay, the dates make sense in the journal entries. Let's leave that. Let's just title the the regular chapters with regular chapter headings, so it's less confusing. And and originally. The novel itself was a little bit more nonlinear, and there were some chapters that took place, you know, a couple months down the line that were earlier in the book, and it, and it jumped around a lot more. But I didn't want it to be, I, while I wanted it to be an innovative book, I didn't want it to be a confusing book. Yeah. And that was important. So I kind of rewrote the timeline of it and changed just some tiny little bit of the story just to make things fit in the timeline better. And mm -hmm. it worked so much better. I'm like, okay, now it, it makes sense. Uh, it seems like Anthony was a pretty hands-on yeah. editor with this oh, book yeah. that you had a really yeah. good collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. Mean, like, I mean, th having that kind of an editor is, is key. I mean, I, I, can't, yeah. I can't speak enough good things about, about, about working with him on this book because, it, not, like, I, like I said, not only earlier did, did I say that he got the book and, you know, loved the book, but it's like, he knew the right things to do that, that sometimes I couldn't see. You know, we didn't cut a lot out of this book. We cut a couple of scenes that were, mm -hmm. you know, funny scenes or whatever, but they just didn't need to be there. Um, but 
yeah, he just he just helped me see, see what what needed to be done and what you know what what were the strengths and what were the things that needed to be stronger, uh, like any good editor should. So, all right, guys, we're coming up on an hour, so um, we got six minutes till an hour, and that's kind of okay. where I wanted to cut it off. So, here here's um, Anthony. You've been quiet as hell. Like um, any, I'm I'm just listening, um, and and you you. You dominate every conversation you ever start. <laughs> not with Cody. Um, Dominic David. Not, not with Cody. Watch what you say about my boo. All right. Um, um, Cody definitely dominates me in conversation. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't... I loved the book. I think there were definitely... Like, with anything, there's going to be parts where I feel like, oh, I, w- I wish Chad had done this. I wish you had done that. Mm-hmm. Like, I wish Dr. Cass was in it more. I yeah, wish there was. I that. wish that the Angel Ghoul storyline gets wrapped up a little bit better. I, I wanted vengeance for what happened to that cat. And, uh, <laughs> but but these, are all, these are all so very nitpicky because I still loved it. I still think you created something that's wholly unique and really impressive for a first novel out. Yeah, and I'm gonna yeah. recommend this to almost any anyone I know would love it. Yeah. So, well, anybody who um, likes very literate, weird, yeah. weird fiction. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, this is this is not you know a mainstream book. No, it's you know, but but it's <laughs> also not but it's is... also not a book that's completely inaccessible. Yeah. Just be just. I guess it walks yeah. a line, you know. I mean, I think I, 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 the way I've always thought about it is that yeah, it's it's equally accessible and inaccessible depending on how you approach it. Depending on who you are and what you, you know, want out of the book, yes. Like, I think the average person that buys books at the airport isn't gonna. Yeah, probably not. To read, and the average, not the, the, the average person that goes yeah. to like a Barnes and Noble rack and <laughs> says know. new releases, oh, what do I want to read? No, somebody who's looking for won't. something adventurous, I hope would for, would. would yeah. For, for, for fans so. of John Gresham, no. <laughs> um, but for fans of like popular weird authors, J.G. Mm-hmm. Ballard, or even people who dig Philip K. Dick's mm-hmm. earlier weird work. Well, it's funny, I've, I've seen some people comparing this to Burroughs, too, which yeah. is interesting. I mean, it's a lot yeah. more, it's a lot the, the less convoluted. <laughs> it's a lot less convoluted than Burroughs. <laughs> but it's, but. it's kind of mind fuckery like Burroughs I guess <laughs> yeah stylistically I'd say it's similar I in terms I don't, of I don't see that comparison I see I see the nail game and I, mm-hmm. I can see a little bit of the ballard I can yeah. see it's I, definitely got a lot of Clive Barker de- and the Clive Barker well, Clive Barker was the game changer for me he, he was yeah. the one you're when, gonna when, hear that a lot when I first read Cabal mm-hmm. like I was like I don't know, thirteen, fourteen when I read that, and and that was when I realized, <coughs> okay, this is this is what you can do with horror novels. Yeah, that that was okay. the great. And that, that was that sent me yeah over to the left side basically. I was like, all right. Yeah, yeah. that was great and secret show and damnation game for uh, me. Uh, yeah. The body politic mm-hmm. for me, that short story, uh, Clive Barker, because that was one where it, the story didn't make any kind of logical sense, mm-hmm. like it was a hand, yeah. you know, yeah. and it didn't. It was so weird. I was like, yeah, it was definitely a game changer for me, too. So I think we all agree that early Clive Barker was really fantastic. Um, oh, yeah. And you're not going to be able to get away from that comparison, I think. Yeah, yeah I don't think you will. You know, uh, as long as, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm fine with that. And as long as people realize that it's not just trying to be like him, then I'm cool with yeah. that. Because I, I, I know that I'm not. I think it's just a part of me yeah. because I've had him in my life you know is is my you know he's one of my favorite living authors it's never derivative of Clive Barker I never set out and say I want to write like Clive Barker but I think I just kind of naturally write similarly to because because I respect the way he creates and the way his his mind thinks to come up with these things that other people don't come up with I mean think Mm -hmm. of all that the books of blood and cabal and damnation game and all especially I mean you know great secret show all this stuff I mean this stuff is like imaginative you know, yeah. that nobody else could have come up with that but I, him. I agree. And that's the kind of writer I want to be. I want to be like, nobody can come up, nobody else could have come up with Secrets of the Weird. Nobody else could possibly come up with what Chad Straub was coming up with. Every because writer. Because he's a weirdo. And that, every, every writer, writer should, should strive that. for that. Yeah. yeah. I believe. And and yeah. most hopefully do. Um, well, but, yeah, I mean, I would, you know, I feel, there's a couple... Yeah, I mean, most of my books, I would say, like, I can't see anybody else writing them. Like, yeah. not that I could see somebody writing something similar. I could see somebody writing similar to Secrets of the Weird. Yeah. However, I can't see anybody writing that book yeah. except for you. And that's one of the reasons why it makes yeah. it such a strong book. Okay, so um, let's let's wrap this up. Um, just, Chad, any last um, minute of thoughts? Uh. I mean, I just appreciate you guys giving giving me this uh, airspace. 
because uh, it means a lot to me that I'm having so much support on my first book, um, not just from, you know, my publisher, but also from, you know, my friends and, and other readers who I may not have known for very long also. I think, you know, the, the early buzz on this is positive, and, and I just, I'm very excited about that, and well, we'll, I, we'll I, think I'll, of a way for you to pay I'll, us back. Yeah, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'm just waiting for the negative reviews to roll in, so I can just be like, oh. And they're wah, gonna, wah. and they're gonna happen. I know, and but you can't. Yeah, it is what it is. What it is. Don't. There's gonna be people that absolutely hate this book. I mean, there's gonna be people that don't know what they're getting into that are that are you know anti-trans or whatever, and they're gonna realize really quickly this. I hate this because there's a yeah. trans protagonist, and, and that's bullshit. well. It's but, your first. It, you know, it's your first book, and let me tell you, like when you. Um, and Anthony went through this with King Space Void. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, a, a point where you can get um, you can um, get really uh, obsessed with reading the reviews, and you shouldn't. Yeah. You, you just gotta kind of flow with it. And because I'm sure, I'm sure I'll still be obsessed with. It. Yeah, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> That's my personality. I'll tell you a story sometime about because <laughs> th- th- there's there's times where one review will come out one day and make you feel terrible about something and then a review the next day will come out and say the exact opposite about yeah. your book. Yeah. But isn't it crazy, right? So it does you can get three reviews and you're like, "Yeah, they fucking got it." And then you get one review and that says, "Oh, this is derivative bullshit. This this is terrible because of this this and this." And you got three reviews that were really good, but you don't give a shit. You care about that yeah. one that no, was bad. No. To this day yeah. there was one short story that I, that I had published once and I remember somebody reviewing it and said it was the only story in the book that was unreadably awful. And it's well, a, it it's wasn't okay. my strongest story. Mm-hmm. I, the thing is, I, what I realized, and, and this isn't just me trying to like toot my own horn, but I'm like, this story was so much unlike the other stories in the book that mm-hmm. were much more traditional. Yeah. And this was me, you know, being all gonzo with my shit. Yeah, but, it's, you know, it's, it's okay, okay that reader just is not into what I was doing. It's okay. But like, good. I have a good reads review that says <laughs> I have an infantile understanding of everything. <laughs> Wow, they nailed it. Ouch. All right. Wow, that wow. Note, excuse me? <laughs> Just kidding. That's, that's a discussion for another day. <laughs> okay. So um, I find it hard to believe that anyone's still listening at this point, but yeah. um, 61 <laughs> minutes in. But if you are, thank you for your time. Uh, Secrets of the Weary, Gray Matter Press. You can buy it on Amazon. And um, if you're in San Diego, head out to Mysterious Galaxies. Oh, and Dark Delicacies on July 15th also. Ooh. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and, uh, and more to come after that. More to come. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, August, right? You going on the road? Uh, sort of. I'm, I'm, I'm hitting up Portland and Seattle in August. Uh, don't know where yet. Um, and then be doing some stuff in Bay Area, Let's Orange talk. County and all that. So. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that because I might yeah. be able to help you. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you for listening. Secrets of the Weird. Uh, get it. Uh, Anthony, last thoughts? Go get it. (laughs) Deep. All right. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody.